So now in this video we turn to thinking a little bit about Earth's surface and why it looks the way it does. And to do that we'll begin and be talking a little bit about in this video about tectonic plates and mountain formation. So to look at the actual image behind here on this opening slide we actually have this map where our land surface topography has been blacked out. So but we're only showing that ocean topography or actually what we term bathymetry uh, or essentially the topography beneath the ocean waters. You know, we may think that uh, really the ocean, you know, what the land is beneath the ocean maybe is flat, but actually what this is showing us is there's quite a bit of variation, kind of those wider areas being um, closer up, or, you know, you don't have to go down as far um, beneath the ocean surface to get to the, to the round uh, versus, uh, you know, the darker areas, the darker blues here being those very uh, darker you know, being deeper and deeper areas. And so we're going to talk about why this is such, such actually an important map for a number of reasons. It kind of helps us get at some of these issues around uh, that we'll be talking about and things like how old is the earth and actually how do we, how did we come to its present formation in terms of the continents and kind of the way it looks today in terms of, again, the processes we're talking about here with tectonic plates and mountain formation. And so especially on that mountain formation idea, which we'll get to by the end of this lecture, um, and kind of tied to that uh, in these issues, uh, some similar lectures of earthquakes and volcanoes, um, but specifically for this video on for mountain formation, kind of gets us for that ties to our song, uh, which for this video is On Top of the World by Imagine Dragons. Now, again, to focus on really what we're looking at here is this, how our Earth was uh, formed to some extent, kind of just in a very quick sense. Before that gets us to more, um, you know, how do how do we have the present makeup and kind of uh, look how the Earth presently appears? So to note that if we are to look and you know in a scientific sense at Earth's age, I'm not going to go into a lot of that detail here, um, but really the idea that we have in terms of a scientific method type of sense of of what the age of the Earth is, is about 4.6 billion years old. And, um, you know, I, I lay that out here in terms of like how it, its initial formation occurred. Um, but really for us, I mean, we're not interested in billions of years ago, um, but we're interested in kind of more in the present day composition and also makeup, you know, and, and appearance of our Earth. And so really today we have five main layers that we could you know, distinguish out um, again, this is also kind of tied to some earth science basics. We're not going into too much detail here, but you can see these and, and review them um, in the slides. Um, really to go you know, to some things that we want to focus a little bit more on um, in terms of earth's composition, um, we can break that out into a few major parts. So it mainly made of minerals and rocks. And yes, those actually are do have a different distinction. You know, sometimes they may be used analogously, but um, to note that minerals here referring to inorganic natural compounds that um, if we're actually getting to the chemistry of things they have specific uh, crystalline structures or rock is essentially an assemblage of multiple minerals that are bound together into the mass of a single material um, and so there's three main principal types of rocks there's igneous sedimentary and metamorphic um, and hopefully you've been exposed at least generally to this idea of these different main rock types. Again, this is kind of earth science basics. Um, and, and we're not going to spend too much time here, but you can once again review on this. Hopefully this is, hopefully this is a review a little bit of how these rocks are, you know, what they are, how they form. Um, and so specifically this brings us to also this idea of the rock cycle and ways that these rocks form in terms of magma and that um, solidifying into different rocks and then perhaps going through undergoing different processes to be formed whether that being an igneous sedimentation or metamorphized and then that, that those rocks can always be changed in these different ways as is seen by this diagram here but really to move this forward you know I'm kind of been pushing through this quickly mainly to get us to the more geographic sense of this so again you know in our interest of geography you know that really when we go to that you know we, we went back a minute ago talking about how the old earth is 4.6 billion years old or so um, but then you know when we actually look at a distribution of the ages of um, most rocks particularly 
on the surface of the ocean floors, we find it interesting uh, was on, that the ages of those rocks are quite interesting and in that um, many of them, we find these patterns that we can see here are actually um, you know, where these colors are indicating different age of oceanic crust. If we actually look at this for a minute, we can see you know, have these you know, almost this very odd uh, system of this network of very young in, in terms of you know, compared to 4.6 billion years old, um, really only 0 to 20 million years old, kind of along we see, we see these boundaries here that are um, driven in, and we'll talk about why we see these. And then older and older ages, really the most, the oldest age we see of what we term oceanic lithosphere, or again that oceanic, um, we'll also term oceanic crust, or just oceanic rocks, you know, that are made, that are the rocks that are making at the bottom of the sea floor, is that none of them are any older than about 260 to 280 million years old, which is interesting when we especially when we start comparing that not only to the age of the earth we talked about you know it being 4.6 billion years old but really most of the continent ages or at least the core what we term the cores of the many of those continents um, have all been around for at least a billion years if not longer and so you know there's 280 million years is much younger than at least over well over a billion years for our continents so the question is well how did we get to this point you know in terms of the age of the crust, we could ask, well, why is the oldest oceanic crust a relatively young, um, you know, 208 to 280 million years old at, at the maximum extent? And in comparison, you know, all the main continents again, are, are, are older than a billion years old. Um, and so the answer here lies that you know, the, the crust or that, you know, those rocks that we're looking at actually on the surface um, actually move about in pieces um, that we term or as plates. So I use that term in the other, uh, in the last slide, but, you know, we term these plates or crusts. Um, and these oceanic plates are denser than continental plates. So when they run into each other, um, as we'll come to see, oceanic plates always get pushed under and oftentimes then melted um, underneath a continental plate. So we can see this here. And so this is due to the composition of the types of rocks that make up continental crust versus oceanic crust. So the continental crust, again, is made up of lower density types of rocks than uh, our oceanic crust. Um, and you can look at those specific types here, and you can look at the, the specific chemicals or, or elements on the periodic table that make those up. Um, but, you know, the idea, once again, is that when we have continental crust and oceanic crust run into each other, um, as we see here, when we term this the lithosphere, or, you know, in that kind of upper layer of our crust of the Earth, um, that oceanic crust is pushed under and uh, that continental crust due to this idea of buoyancy, you know, where, a, where we have, again, it, different densities here. Um, and this is the same idea as why a rubber duck floats on water, um, you know, where something, you know, the rubber duck is less dense and will float in a material that uh, has a, a greater density, in that case water. Um, but, you know, it's the same idea in terms of, of different types of rocks. Um, and, uh, also and it's also based on age of rocks, as we'll come to see um, a little bit later on as well. So this, again, is tied to these, you know, then larger and especially longer term time scales when we're talking hundreds of thousands, millions, hundreds of millions of years into those billions of years, you know, changes in the configuration of Earth's crust um, as a result of in the internal forces underneath kind of moving around the, the rocks that lie on top. So again, the rocks that we lie on top, what we term the lithosphere, essentially the, the, the crust. Um, but we have uh, uh, inner layers, what we term the asthenosphere, and then further down within that, the mantle and those inner layers that we looked, that we brief, went briefly over in the beginning. And so, you know, there's, there's different processes such as this upwelling of magma from underneath uh, in Earth, and kind of these, this molten rock, you know, and that helps then circulate in, in over long time scales in terms of our own, you know, well beyond our individual lives. But, um, you know, over hundreds of thousands, millions of years, we get this movement of uh, these lithospheric plates, sea floor, sea floor spreading, subduction, we'll get to these processes here in a minute, and, you know, that moves these plates over, uh, you know, the, our, the whole, what we see as their surface over very long time scales. And so this, 
idea of, in what we more generally call plate tectonics theory you know, arose from observations of looking at our uh, different continents. Once we, you know, we had a good idea and, and had mapped the world you know, to note that, okay, well, you know, interestingly, you know, we do see kind of almost symmetric or similar shapes along certain continents, like, say, South America and Africa. And so there's kind of a question of, well, could those have at one point been together? Could they have been an assembled you know, piece that somehow broke apart? I mean, you know, the question at the time, of course, was what caused those pieces to separate from each other? And so this idea of a plate tectonics theory really is at least 100 years old, um, perhaps even older, but at least the most famous uh, person to kind of put this idea forward um, is Alfred Wagner, uh, who a German uh, kind of initially laid this idea out in 1915. And so in this book called The Origin of Continents and Oceans, essentially proposed what he called continental drift, or the idea that the continents that we see on, you know, or that are above the oceans, uh, that they can actually move around. But, you know, his work, uh, interestingly, was not ended up to really being widely accepted as, as, as the theory of continental drift, or this idea of plate tectonics theory, until at least about 50 years later. later. Um, and actually, Wagner was also the one who initially proposed the idea of a Pangaea, um, so you may be familiar with this idea of a supercontinent that was comprised of all land masses that were together uh, hundreds of million years ago, and we'll go over that really briefly here in a minute. Um, but you know, and he based that off of some different evidence that was being found at the time in the early 1900s of finding fossils um, and distribution of rock types that were in, say, for example, the central, uh, southern parts of South America and parts of Africa that you know, essentially the same fossils were being found, the same distribution of rock types, um, even, you know, kind of proxies for climate records. We've gone over that a little bit now in the past. You know, some of those were matching up for certain places um, that, you know, were now spread apart in different continents. And so it seemed to make sense that, well, we we're finding the same exact things, you know, that were, and it seemed like the continents maybe had some chance in the past to be together, that it would make sense that somehow the continents split apart over time. Um, but Generally, at this time when Wagner proposed these ideas, he, you know, any place that he presented them, more or less, he oftentimes was left out of the room um, by other scientists at the time who did not believe that this could possibly occur. Um, again and again, so that brings us back to that really this idea as a scientific theory. And again, we've talked about scientific theory you know, at the beginning of this class. We went through how we get to a scientific theory, you know, proving kind of having multiple lines of evidence. You know, in, in not being able to disprove an idea, it really plate tectonic theory became much more widely accepted um, during the 1950s and 1960s as we gained more advanced kind of measurement technologies. Um, they were able to, in a number of ways, confirm actually Wagner's ideas and hypotheses about continental drift. And one of the main um, ones that was not able to be disproven, if we're talking about in a scientific theory way, um, it really kind of forms the basis for continental drift is this idea of sea floor spreading areas and how we can detect those. So again, that's where we saw on that map where we're seeing those those very youngest crust ages, you know, of essentially that actually we can have new crust being formed at any time. So they're very, you know, even, um, so they, some of it may have been formed right at these what we term mid-ocean ridges during our lifetimes. Um, but, you know, it is, you know, in terms of the millions of years old an older time scale, um, you know, extremely young. And so it, where these new crust is being formed, um, we find that the magnetic material actually that's bubbling up within the lava that then cools on the ocean floor um, actually become oriented in certain directions based on the magnetic field of Earth at the time they cool. So again, that's tied to the uh, magnetic poles. So we're roughly based around where North and South poles are. Um, those move over time touched a tiny bit on that in the past. You could um, go do some more individual looking up on that, but we're not going to go into detail here. But essentially the idea is that the magnetic alignment of actually the magnetic material in those rocks, you can detect with very powerful um, magnets or specific types of magnets. Um, and so, and recorders that we now have in terms of technology. So really that being developed in the 1950s, 1960s, and being able to see 
um, kind of these different striping bands within um, different orientations when, again, over millions of years, we know that um, Earth's magnetism, uh, and especially on those magnetic poles, has shifted over time and also has uh, flipped um, in terms of its magnetic orientation a number of times. That was able kind of to be an, a big um, indicator that, yes, actually Alfred Wagner's ideas um, pretty much seem to have a lot of merit um, in, in reality of the shaping and, and very observation that we can see uh, in terms of the seafloor and it's kind of and it's again observing the seafloor and seeing that within the rocks and the magnetic alignment of the material in those rocks and so we see our present day uh, distribution of our these mid-ocean ridges or ocean ridges um, and we Again, that kind of ties back to what we saw at the beginning of this lecture, the slide where I was showing you the ocean bathymetry. And you can see some of these areas where actually you know, there's kind of like almost like little mini mountain ridges or ranges um, on the ocean floor. And so they're usually not as deep compared to other areas within the ocean. So again, uh, I said we'd touch on Pangea as well really briefly. So we did see this over 200 million years ago, kind of the connection of all the continents and then their eventual breakup. Uh, once again, I'm not going to go really into any detail on that here, um, but you can see that here and, and go find it for more information about that, read about it. But to bring us to today, once again, um, in kind of our present distribution of Earth's major plates as we can kind of see them uh, shown here today, as well as uh, a really fuzzy picture, unfortunately, here, this in Chopal, um, but this picture here where it's actually supposed to be showing kind of the direction of movement uh, of the different plates and based on individual measurements made across many of those plates. So not that they're all moving in the same direction, they kind of have different magnitudes um, as well as amounts of movement, um, usually within millimeters or centimeters per year, so very, very small per individual year, as we might uh, kind of have a good time scale for us to think about it. But, you know, over millions, hundreds of millions of years, those millimeters and centimeters add up um, to very, very large movements of distance over time. So when we're thinking about these plate, plate, these uh, plates, and specifically their the boundaries between them, there are different types of boundaries, and there are three main types that we'll be going through here. So there's divergent, or where the plates are diverging or moving apart from each other. And they're convergent, or where they are running into each other. They're kind of going in opposite. They're kind of running into each other because they're going opposite directions. And uh, transform faults, where we have plates that are kind of trying to slide past each other, uh, in a sense. So we'll go through each of these kind of in turn, uh, where we have first divergent plate boundaries. So again, where one plate um, is essentially breaking apart, or um, two plates are moving apart from each other. Um, so there's a number of examples you kind of point to um, in kind of landforms that these produce. So um, we see the rift valleys on lands. So again, we're seeing land that are kind of splitting apart, um, or also mid-ocean ridges that we just talked about uh, in, underneath the oceans. So you can see an example of a mid-ocean ridge, um, actually that's been exposed above ground um, in Iceland. As you see this picture on the right, a lot of um, and a whole national park in Iceland tied to this. So you see here we're actually seeing this split apart. Um, but also other examples, uh, parts of East Africa, um, and the rift zones there. Uh, and the continents kind of part of, part of that is breaking apart uh, at present. And also against again, uh, in terms of underwater, these mid-ocean ridges where we can have this magma welling up, um, it's cooling on the ocean surface uh, or on, on the ocean um, on the ground there. And we then have that you know, build up of these almost mini mountain ranges um, underneath the ocean. Um, and you know, again, where we have these, uh, plates uh, or at any plate boundary where two plates are spreading apart. Now going where we have two plates kind of running into each other and going opposite directions. So uh, these convergent plate boundaries and different types of uh, these as well. So and we can have where one ocean, we have an oceanic plate running into a continental plate. So we talked about this a little bit earlier. We're, once again, we'll see that subduction of the oceanic crust between the continental crust because uh, that oceanic crust crust is more dense than the continental crust and this produces a number of produces a number of landforms uh, mainly one of the main ones we see that are uh, we term volcanic arcs or volcanic mountains um, this is a great example is right here around us in Oregon the Cascade Range um, but also ocean trenches and we'll talk a little bit more about these in another few slides but kind of out here where the plate uh, the oceanic plate is being subducted underneath the 
continental one that kind of usually uh, actually extends out a little bit into the ocean. Um, usually we have you know, these very deep areas um, as this kind of continental, excuse me, the oceanic plate is being subducted and kind of pulled under. Um, it kind of creates this much deeper area that we know that we term ocean trenches. So uh, another type of convergent plate boundary though could be between say two oceanic plates. Um, and so the question here is, well, which plate actually ends up going underneath the other one um, if, you know, they're both pretty dense. We've talked about you know, the density here. Um, and to note here that this then is where age oftentimes comes in um, because usually it is the older plate that ends up getting subducted. The main reason for this is because uh, those you know, the older plates, they were formed longer ago. They are relatively colder in the sense that they, uh, you know, the rock of them was not formed recently, you know, by that magma upwelling and being cooled, say, on those mid-ocean ridges. Um, and so um, it is the, because those older plates are relatively colder, um, they're also more dense than uh, those younger plates, or the ones that they end up being kind of hotter in a sense. Um, so this one's again produces a number of for landforms, uh, island arcs, so island volcanoes, a series of oftentimes volcanoes that are islands is once again uh, also ocean trenches and so some examples a series of different islands there's the Aleutian Islands in Alaska um, also Japanese islands many of these are um, uh, uh, island arcs but to note that actually Hawaii you may you may think oh volcanic islands Hawaii um, Hawaii is actually not at a convergent plate boundary. We'll, we'll talk about the separate issue of what Hawaii exactly is why it, and why it's different um, and when we talk about volcanoes. But just make sure we know Hawaii is not uh, at a convergent plate boundary. It's, it's really made, based on a separate phenomenon that we'll get to back to when we talk, specifically talk more uh, of a whole lecture on volcanoes. Um, so once again, just to make sure that we're clear on the difference between mid-ocean ridges and ocean trenches, um, you know, sometimes Students get their get the get these two mixed up very easily, um, but to make and once again just reinforce that mid ocean ridges, as a ridge implies, actually built up. They're almost underwater mountains. And again, that's where those are being formed at divergent boundaries. Um, we're you know, having that spreading apart, but then that magma is welling up um, and, and kind of actually building up material there. Where then we have ocean trenches, you know, as a trench, we can think of, you know, is, is down within something, um, you know, it, it's kind of, it's a depression. You know, ocean trenches are formed at convergent boundaries, um, where we're having, again, that oceanic crust often is being pulled under, and it creates this very deep depression here um, underneath a continental crust, for example. Um, but also we can have that same type of phenomenon between two oceanic plates. So finally, type of uh, our final type of convergent boundary where we now have also two continental plates. Uh, we could have an example um, where you know, one continent runs into another. Um, and to note here, again, both of our continental crusts in this case now are relatively less dense. Neither one really wants to be pushed down very much um, to be subducted. So when these plates collide, they oftentimes are just kind of push each other up and form oftentimes quite high mountains. Um, and so you know, the premier example of this um, in terms of our landforms produced you know, a mountain range uh, is the Himalayan or Himalaya mountains that uh, we have uh, in uh, South and kind of South East Asia. Um, and, to, and to note that you know, this is a prime example of the, what we term the Indian subcontinent um, within the past uh, tens of millions of years kind of running into Asia, uh, the Asian continent part of the uh, Eurasian continent and uh, or plate and so that collision has been creating uh, the Himalaya uh, there and a very very high you know our highest mountains in the world at present so and just to very then briefly note our third type of plate boundary our transform plate boundary here where once again we're having lateral kind of two plates kind of laterally move past each other to some extent um, and our example that once again we'll come back to a little bit more with uh, earthquakes, actually, um, we'll talk about the San Andreas Fault kind of being a part of that. And so, if you're looking for maybe a little more of a hands-on activity to help you keep all these straight, I point you to Oreos. Um, I am not in any way uh, being uh, 
paid off by the Oreo Corporation or anything, but um, you know, just to note that you can, this is a kind of a fun hands-on activity that you can use, uh, as shown by the images here, um, to help you keep uh, the different types of boundaries straight that we just talked through. Well, finally, we turn to mountain building, um, and um, specifically the term uh, that uh, we use to refer to mountains as they are built is known as orogenesis. Um, so again, this uh, if you based in a Greek word, um, so oros being the Greek word for mountain, so oro, and then genesis, the birth of, so literally the birth of mountains, or in orogeny, um, being in mountain building episode occurring over millions of years uh, involving large-scale deformation and uplift of the crust as I've written here so make sure um, always like to make the joke here and originally in orogeny make sure that is uh, separate from an orgy those pre those um, produce different things um, but uh, types of orogenies um, as we would refer to them correspond to different plate boundaries so for example um, the laramide orogeny is the one that has formed the Rocky Mountains, where the Allegheny Orogeny uh, is the one that formed the Appalachian Mountains uh, in the eastern United States. And so you can note the difference there, where the Rocky Mountains were formed much more recently, about 40 to 80 million years ago, compared to the Appalachian Mountains about 250 to 300 million years ago. And that was actually uh, as part of the formation uh, and basis of Pangaea. But the, um, to focus on a, the Laramide Orogeny just for a second here, um, you know, it's again, produced about 40 to 80 million years ago and actually occurring in you know kind of an interesting case because it occurred so far to the interior of a plate um, and occurred you know, almost a thousand miles from the nearest subduction zone or um, actually what was known as the Farallon plate at the time um, which is kind of broken up and mostly been consumed but there's a little bit of the Juan de Fuca plate of its left which is actually um, tied to what is being subducted under and creating the Cascade Mountains now presently um, you know Essentially, this um, plate uh, of the Farallon plate was being subducted under here, um, and when it was going under the North American plate, um, and you know, kind of, but being at a very shallow angle, um, went uh, quite a ways further in um, to create the Rocky Mountains. So, when you should look at this dis distribution of the Rocky Mountains, you know, again, very much further in land um, compared to the Cascade Mountains. So, we see this, you know, our more present example, and we see volcanic mountains, for example. In the Cascade Range here, um, the one you know, we have, uh, in what we now term the Juan de Fuca Plate, uh, kind of the remnants of that being subducted underneath uh, the North American Plate here, and again, provi providing really this series of uh, the Cascade Range and the uh, different volcanic mountains that we have as part of that. So we'll revisit this once a little bit more, um, specifically with different types of volcanoes in the volcano lecture, and because really what this leads us to is the conclusion of this lecture, um, where we have this present distribution of uh, different uh, tectonism and volcanism, um, you know, and earthquakes within really the past one million years, or at least evidence that we have some of these more recent activities and kind of the distribution of those at many different plate boundaries. So again, we'll be revisiting this, kind of using this as the basis for further lectures, both on earthquakes and volcanoes.